believe so. Here we go. We're recording, everything's good. All right, so five, four, three, two, and one. All right, folks, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. Very excited to have back Alisa Zapersky. Alisa, welcome back. Thank you. Glad yeah. to be back. Yeah. So Alisa was uh, on the Trauma Therapist Podcast um, a few months ago, episode 471. And, you know, there, when I talk to someone, who exudes passion about this work. I'm like, I've got to have them back. And that's why you're back. I mean, I love talking to you. And um, uh, for those uh, listeners who didn't get to hear that episode, uh, let me just read your bio and then we'll uh, bring people up to speed and get going here. So Alisa is a storyteller, a writer, a facilitator, and childhood sexual abuse survivor. Her work focuses on offering emotional support to other young survivors healing from sexual trauma. Elisa is a Moth Story Slam competition champ, and she's been in publications such as Allure, Teen Vogue, Bust, and Time. While based in DC, she travels around the country giving talks and facilitating workshops to support other young survivors in their communities. Um, so how have you been? You know, I've been okay. Uh, it has been um, a wild time for all of us. And it's funny because I do feel like everything I have to say is like a cliche that I already saw on the internet um, of what everybody says when they ask each other, how you been? Like, mm -hmm. you know, very lucky that we've been able to stay in the house and be safe. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a goddamn roller coaster over here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's tough. I don't know about you, but, you know, and I might have even shared this with you, but when all this started, I was so anxious. You know, I was trying to keep up with the news when we're talking about COVID, trying to keep up with the news and I was going nuts. I mean, uh, it was really, I could feel it. And I was like, I just got to stop doing that. I, so I needed to really be intentional about, you know, what I was and was not doing, but um I think everyone's, you know, whether it sounds cliche or not, it's true. We, we were all have heightened senses of anxiousness at this point. Totally, totally. And I think that, you know, I'll, I'll have like six weeks where I'm like, okay, I am getting up in the morning. I know that I just need to focus on what's right in front of me today. What is in my control? What is in my wheelhouse? And and focus there. And then, you know, my trauma will kick in and there'll be a couple of weeks that are just really gnarly. And I think that that ebbing and flowing is really what I've heard from so many other people. And mm -hmm. it's been really um, wild at healinghonestly.com, uh, which has been around for four years that um, within the duration of the pandemic, the um, the web traffic has increased uh, 252%. So I compared I compared February 2020 to, to um, it was August 2020 was the last time I, I looked at those numbers and it was at 252%. Wow. And, and I'm just hearing from people, I mean, truly all across the world um, who are, are really triggered right now. And a lot of folks who are CSA survivors who have not experienced this level of their trauma being ever present with them like they mm -hmm. have right now. It's something they either felt like they had found a way to cope with in a day-to-day -day way that wasn't intrusive for them. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, hello, I am mm -hmm. demanding your attention. Mm -hmm. We are going to, we're going to talk about this trauma. Um, and I think it's so many things. It's not feeling safe. Um, and that bringing up um, really primal times and really, you know, primary times in our lives where we didn't feel safe. Um, and also just the time and space alone in our heads and our minds, uh, you know, so many of our coping mechanisms are not available to us anymore. And just sitting with our own thoughts um, can be really triggering for so many of us. Right, right. So... Um, your website, as you mentioned, is healinghonestly.com. So who reaches out to you? Who is your site for? So my site is really for um, childhood sexual abuse survivors specifically, but I do hear from, um, from people who've survived the sexual violence of all sorts. Um, and really, it's become interesting, the sort of niche area, um, which is not so niche, I have learned, 
is really um, childhood sex abuse survivors who are adults who are trying to live full and vibrant lives and asking themselves, what now and what next? Mm -hmm. And trying, you know, interested in talking about having full and meaningful relationships, healthy sex lives, good friendships, you know, all of these parts of our lives and trying to figure out how to make sense of something that happened to us so long ago that is still very much impacting our day-to-day lives. And even more specifically to that is this area of adult CSA survivors who have questions around their memories of what happened to them and um, may feel um, a sense of uncertainty or invalidation in their survivorship because they don't have these clear narrative memories of what happened to them. And that is really, oh, I have to tell you, like 80% of the people that I hear from. Um, and, and people looking for validation um, and some sort of understanding of how to move forward in their lives when it's really difficult for them to make sense of, of what happened to them. So, for example, someone might have a, a foggy memory or faint memory or uh, a few pieces of the puzzle and have a feeling about that, but not feel justified because what they don't maybe don't believe it or it's not a complete picture or not a complete memory, something like that. Totally. So um, it, it varies a lot. It can be people who are like, I know this happened to me, but I still have these moments of doubt. Um, and it, or it can be people who are like, I am, I am 30 years old. I am 70 years old. I've heard I'm 80 years old and something happened and it triggered something inside of me and all these light bulbs went off. And I just know in my core that this person harmed me Mm -hmm. and it's difficult. How do I make sense of these body memories when my mind might not be having a clear beginning, middle and end Mm -hmm. to the story of what happened. And, you know, it's something that I talk so much about in my writing and actually um, really exciting and launching a small group coaching around specifically CSA survivors who have had questions around memory um, and offering support and guidance um, to to people who identify as that because there are so many sources of this invalidation, Um, whether it is our larger societal lack of understanding of the way trauma, memory, and the brain work together, right? Or the fact that we live in a world of steeped in rape culture that tells us that there is some quote unquote real survivor out there. And for X, Y, and Z reason, we're not it. And so we can point to this not remembering clearly somehow as proof that we're not a real survivor um, because we're always told there's some reason we're not a real survivor or that we live in a world where overwhelmingly the way we still talk about sexual violence is in the context of the criminal justice system where ideas of evidence and proof are are you know put at the as necessary as as sort of these pillars of like okay well that's a real survivor because Mm -hmm. they have evidence and proof and it would hold up in a court of law as though Mm -hmm. like the vast majority of us ever have anything to do with uh with reporting our harm to to the state so there's sounds like there's so many ways for us and so many avenues to feel unjustified uh in our in our own feelings totally yeah, you mentioned you mentioned just quickly. You mentioned coaching. Um, mm-hmm. Is that up and running? Can we put a link up for people? That's- yeah, okay. yeah, we absolutely can. And actually, something that's really exciting as well is that ever since I launched four years ago, I've been hearing so much specifically from therapists and counselors who are CSA survivors who have struggled with questions around memory. Um, and so I am going to be launching also a specific small group coaching for counselors and oh. survivors who are CSA survivors, um, because I mean, counselors and therapists who are CSA survivors, because I've just been hearing so much from people uh, who are in this field who are dealing with these same questions and 
um, dealing with treating PFEMs and supporting mm-hmm. survivors while also it triggering and bringing up questions around their own trauma. Um, and so offering specific support for that as well. Wow, very cool. Um, now we talked a little bit before we started recording here that you had some information, you kind of surveyed your audience specifically. Let's kind of get into that. Absolutely. So I was so excited that I was coming back on the podcast. I had such a wonderful time with you. Um, Truly, truly. There aren't a ton of highlights of the last six months. So, (laughs) you know, not to get too big for you bridges, but like you don't have a lot of competition right now. But um, but I had the best time on your podcast. So I was so excited I was coming back. Um, and I uh, reached out to my, my, um, followers on Instagram and I, um, because so many CSA survivors follow me and I said, I told them, I said, you know, I'm going to be talking to a large, a large group of trauma therapists. What do you wish trauma therapists knew? What would you want me to tell them on your behalf? Mm. And it was amazing because everything about this work, it's like, you know, my work centers around my story as a means of illustrating what I'm trying to talk about. Um, But when the, but it, it's those, it's moments like those where you connect to the fact that this is like so much bigger than any one person in any one story. Um, And that um, it just, the connection between survivors can be just really powerful and transformative. So that, that was just a reminder of that for me. But um, what I heard a lot of was, um, in addition to the memory stuff, which we, we also talked about in our first episode together, and, um, and really being worried that therapists are going to try to make survivors recall memories that may or may not be there, um, was that survivors really wanted therapists to understand the harm that the state can cause for survivors and the re-traumatization that survivors can experience when engaging with the state or the criminal justice system in any capacity. And so um, specifically like also a desire for therapists to learn about other forms of justice for survivors, including transformative justice. So one survivor was telling me that they found it really a really negative experience that they were in therapy and their therapist was actually surprised by how much trauma they had experienced by the state coming in and removing the abuser from the survivor's home. And then the survivor having like court mandated therapy and the therapist was like surprised that this survivor um, didn't want their parent to be removed from the home because it actually made the survivor more in danger for a variety of reasons. It made them even more vulnerable to harm as a result. And um, there was sort of a a, a lack of understanding from the therapist about this happening. And I heard from other survivors who were sexually assaulted by police officers, who um, were sexually assaulted by lawyers, um, who also had experiences where their therapists were really surprised by that even though we know that um, when it comes to occupations um, and people who commit sexual violence, that cops and lawyers and doctors are the three top professions. Um, And yeah, and and people need to know that, that, you know, so for survivors, these sort of quote unquote systems that are, were allegedly designed to offer us um, some sort of semblance of justice actually are more often than not sites of incredible harm for us. And a lot of survivors, myself included as an abolitionist, don't want our stories to be used to justify a police and prison state. And don't want our stories and the harm we experience, for example, to cause somebody to go to jail or prison where they can experience additional, where that person mm-hmm. might experience sexual violence and thus the cycle of sexual violence continues. Mm-hmm. And so I heard from survivors saying, I, you know, like I wish therapists understood that it goes so far beyond the binary of victim and perpetrator. Because in reality, the vast majority of CSA survivors were harmed by somebody who themselves 
was a victim Mm -hmm. of childhood sexual abuse. And so a lot of survivors are really interested in questions about like how we end sexual violence and the cycle of sexual violence beyond like these sort of Mm -hmm. one-off opportunities for, again, quote unquote justice in a system really designed not to support and help survivors. And, um, and so I heard that over and over again, and there are a couple um, resources and leaders that, I've, uh, that have helped me r- really so much along in my journey to understanding abolition, um, especially as a white woman, like this movement has been led by black and indigenous, queer and trans childhood sexual abuse survivors for generations. And mm-hmm. um, there are so many doing like incredible work but um, but as like a great starting point, which helped me a lot in my journey, um, in addition to Love with Accountability, which we talked about last time, Aisha Shahida Simmons anthology um, that centers Black diaspora CSA survivors and non-state um, means of accountability for CSA survivors is also this incredible anthology called Beyond Survival, Strategies and Stories from the Transformative Justice Movement. And there are essays about people practicing other forms of justice that really center survivors' needs and desires um, and actually ending cycles of violence versus centering punishment, including an, um, an essay from my dear friend, Amitha Swadin, who is the founder of Mirror Memoirs. And Amitha is a CSC survivor and wrote an essay about how they, um, and they were harmed by their father. And they wrote an essay about how they sought accountability to prevent their father from continuing to harm people um, in a way that didn't involve the state because of the harm that the state can continue, which is really amazing. So I just want to throw that out there to to listeners because there's so much to learn about this. But I really heard, especially in the context of the uprisings that have been around the nation, Um, to support Black lives and to end state-sponsored violence, specifically also against Black people, um, that this is a really amazing opportunity to learn to support um, survivors that come into people's offices, or I guess into people's Skype boxes Mm -hmm. (laughs) these days, into people's cell phones. Um, Because for the vast majority of us, the system that we have doesn't doesn't mean anything close to justice or healing for us. What is what is transformative justice? So I am not an expert on transformative justice, which I just want to add here, which okay. is why I've, I've, I've referenced this book. But transformative justice is a form of, of um, justice, a collective community justice that um, specifically Black and Indigenous, queer and trans people have been practicing for forever um, in communities where it really centers um, the questions of how to end harm and how to center what a survivor actually wants and needs in their own healing. Um, And so, and it necessarily doesn't involve the state in the process. And so there are lots of, you know, with these two anthologies, I can't recommend them enough as sort of jumping off points to learn more about the transformative justice movement. There's also the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective out in the Bay Area, and they specifically practice intervening on childhood sexual abuse in a transformative justice way. So using community-centered approaches to um, to interrupting and ending the cycles of childhood sexual abuse that don't involve the state at all. Wow. Okay. This is a lot of information and I think really, really interesting information for a lot of therapists to hear because what I'm kind of hearing and distilling is that a lot of the people you polled and responded, responded to you were Mm -hmm. not just simply talking about their own healing, but like their own concentric circle, but that it ripples out. And it's so important for the healing to ripple out more. Um, and it's, totally. it's, it's not surprising to me, at least to hear that a lot of therapists were quite frankly, just uninformed about 
how impactful trauma, the different types of trauma can be. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I started this, but it's no less, um, it's just so frustrating. It's so frustrating. Uh, I, I can't imagine what the, the, you know, your, the followers you have on Instagram, what their feelings are about therapists. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think that, I think that um, it's a mixed bag. you know, some people reached out and were, um, were saying things that helped them and support them, like their therapist um, really modeled healthy boundaries for them. And that was a really important and beautiful thing for them. Or their therapist helped validate and affirm, you know, their own survivorship when they were feeling like they they couldn't sort of claim the pain that they had been through as meaningful and real to them. And so there's lots of positive stuff there too, of course. Um, but I, I really was really interested in hearing this from folks and for bringing it to the podcast, because I think especially in a field such as therapy that is still overwhelmingly white, um, and I myself included, not a therapist, but like white lady living in white culture, um, that especially, it's especially important for us to learn about how these systems disproportionately impact mm -hmm. Um, people who live at the centers of oppression and different forms of oppression and um, and to understand and learn also from the leadership of Black and Indigenous, queer and trans um, survivors and leaders who have been doing this work for a very, very long time um, to show us another way of being um, and another way of healing. Um, and so I think you know, it's a really uh, important opportunity, especially now, especially when so many people are asking questions about what accountability really looks like and what does accountability really mean um, for harm and what role does the state have to play in that? Um, it's a really important time, I think, to learn even more about this. I'm wondering if, if some of the therapists out there who are listening to this are, are thinking, Wait a minute. So am I, it might, I could see where some people might say, wait, but I'm responsible for all of this. Everyone's healing. What about the person just sitting in front of me? Isn't it enough that I'm working with them? Mm. Yeah. I mean, it is enough that you're working with that one person, but a lot of people are showing up into therapy, their full self, having experienced multiple forms of trauma, and they need a therapist who understands that, right. you know, they need a therapist who understands why the, what happened after they were sexually abused might actually have caused them even more harm than the sexual abuse itself. Mm. Um, and, or why they, a survivor had a lot of pressure to report um, to the state, you know, what happened to them and they didn't want to, and they need a therapist to understand why that might be. Um, or they need a therapist to understand why it feels really complicated for them that they don't want the person who harmed them to go to prison. Right. And what that does and doesn't mean for their healing. Because I think for a lot of survivors, there's still this pressure that like, if we didn't report it, it didn't really happen. Or if we didn't report it or take some sort of public accountability that mm -hmm. we're not gonna heal from this. Or even worse, that we're responsible for the harm continuing. And I think so many survivors feel that. They feel like if they don't speak out and they don't martyr themselves, then they're responsible for the fact that this person continues to harm people. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, yes, it is these larger social questions, but people are showing up in everyone's offices or Zoom sessions carrying a lot of these questions and they may or may not feel comfortable communicating them. But I think it's really important for therapists to understand that these are some of the considerations and um, conflicts that live within CSA survivors. Um, they feel conflicted about this. They feel worried that this means that they can't heal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. This is this is an awesome discussion. I mean, it's 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 I think addressing 
uh, bringing light to a facet, um, a facet of, of trauma and trauma healing and trauma therapy that quite frankly, I haven't talked that much about. And it's crazy to think that there are so many different facets to trauma and, and healing and so forth. Um, let's just quickly uh, reintroduce you. So I'm speaking with Elisa Zapersky. Where can people best get in contact with you, Elisa? Uh, my website at healinghonestly.com. Okay. And your um, the coaching program that you're putting together for therapists, which I think is an awesome mm -hmm. idea. In a nutshell, what are they going to get out of that? So they're going to get a small group uh, experience of being connected with other therapists who are also CSA survivors who have also had questions around memory and their survivorship. And they're going to be guided through a six-week program where they receive validation from one another and ultimately learn more strategies about how to offer themselves validation. So they can turn down the volume on some of these really harmful, untrue stories that can dominate our lives and can hear more clearly their own um, inner wisdom as they continue on their own healing journey and to support survivors in their practices too. Awesome, awesome, okay. And again, we'll have uh, that and your other coaching program linked up. You can send me those links. We'll have that linked up at the show notes page at traumatherapistpodcast.com. Um, all right, so as we, as we kind of wind down here, let's, let's wrap this up here. What, what, how can we, I don't want to say tie a bow on this, you can't, but yeah. what, 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 do we, what do we want to get out there? What do you want, what's the message you want to kind of end up with today? Yeah, I think the message is that trauma therapists, it's wonderful to keep learning and to keep going and like focus. There's so much good work that's happening, that's going on. Um, and I think especially your listeners um, have a demonstrative interest in continuing to learn and grow and expand. Um, and that there is so much wisdom specifically, I think in um, CSA survivors who are abolitionists who are leading this work for alternative forms of, um, of justice and um, healing, and that there are all these different exciting things that are happening in the healing space. Um, and I encourage you all to continue to learn about it um, and read and learn and check people out. And, um, and I'll give you, you know, a list of some reading um, and some folks that people can also follow on social media to learn more too. Yeah, yeah, well said. And I would, I would also add that it's, it's, uh, it's a responsibility to, to, you know, to educate oneself as a trauma therapist, you know, it's great to learn, but it's a responsibility. And what you're talking about here is, uh, you know, just additional levels of education and learning that are so necessary out there. I love that you polled your audience, surveyed them and got this information. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to share this. At least I want to thank you um, for coming back on here again. It's awesome talking with you. It's always a pleasure. So happy to be here. All right. Take care.